some form or other. What I'm going to do, my title is Free Speech Under Attack, is first of all to lay out the broader arguments about free speech and the changed circumstances of free speech in the connected world, and then move more briefly to the question of under attack and what the nature of the attack is, and then open it up for discussion. Let me start, if I may, slightly interactively in these days of interactivity. Might I ask if there is anyone in this room who does not think free speech is in principle a good thing? Please put up your hand if you think it's not even in principle a good thing. Well, I don't see a single hand put up. Um, the other day I gave a lecture at Durham University and there was one hand put up, which I thought deserved a medal for bravery, apart from anything else. And actually, it's very interesting, it was a Chinese student. Uh, and he came up afterwards and explained to me why. And basically the reason was China isn't ready for, for, for free speech. Okay, now let me ask you a second question, which maybe one or two hands will go up. Is there anyone in this room who does not have something looking like that in their pocket or handbag or at home? Uh, a not entirely young gentleman in the second row put up his hand. Uh, there's normally one or two, I think, who rather proudly say they don't have one, but most of us do. Okay, so what frames our subject is the collision or the combination of those two votes that you've just shown. So we believe that free speech is a good thing, although perhaps we haven't entirely articulated in our own minds why it is. John Stuart Mill meets the smartphone. The arguments for free speech are for the most part old or even ancient arguments. The conditions in which we are trying to exercise freedom of expression and freedom of information are entirely new. First, to the arguments. Um, one could spend an hour on them. I won't, don't worry. But in the book, I argue that there are, broadly speaking, in the liberal tradition, four main arguments for why free speech is essential. I give the shorthand acronym STGD, Self, Truth, Government, Diversity. So the four arguments are, first of all, Without freedom of expression, we cannot fully express ourselves. You might in theory say you have what the Germans call Gedankenfreiheit, freedom of thought, if your lips are strapped with sellotape and you're stuck in a prison cell with no one to talk to. But actually even that is dubious. Because I don't know about you, but I only know what I'm really thinking when I've written it. Tristan Zara, the Dadaist, said, the thought is in the mouth. So even freedom of thought is not really possible without the possibilities of communication. Self-expression in dress, in music, in theater, in art, in all other ways. The T is for truth, and this is of course in universities, you already alluded to it, a central argument for free speech. In the English tradition, it goes back to John Milton and John Stuart Mill. It is that you need free speech to seek the truth and to come as close to it as we ever can. And Mil uh, Mill famously argued that even a largely false argument may contain some small sliver of truth, some grain of truth. And even if the argument is totally false, nonetheless, we keep the good sword of truth bright and sharp by testing it against the acts of falsehood. Um, and this, this ancient argument seems to me as valid today as it ever was. Then the G for good government. How can we govern ourselves well unless we, the people, the citizens, are confronted with all the arguments for and against a particular policy, for different policy alternatives, and as you mentioned, crucially, all the evidence, all the facts before making up our minds. And finally, a rather, probably the newest argument, which is one very relevant to this country, but also to contemporary Europe, how do we live well with diversity unless we have freedom of expression? F diversity means living with difference. How can I understand what it is to be a Muslim or a lesbian or a Kurd or a Sinti and Roma 
or a communist or a Catholic unless that has been articulated. Unless members of those groups have been able to say what it is to be them. I quote a wonderful song by Nina Simone. It's called, I wish I could know what it means to be free, how it feels to be free. And the crucial line is, I wish you could know what it means to be me. And both parts are crucial in freedom of expression, which is a freedom of the speaker and the listener, the writer and the reader. It's my freedom to speak, to express myself, but also your freedom to hear or not to hear if you wish not to. These classic modern arguments for free speech, however, are taking place in completely transformed circumstances, transformed by two things, by mass migration and by this magic box you have in your pocket or handbag. Through this magic box, you can at least in theory instantaneously communicate with half of humankind. Roughly three billion plus people are either on mobile phone or the internet and the number's going up fast. What that means is, as never before in human history, that we are living in a world in which everyone is becoming neighbors with everybody else. Something which is said in London can be heard instantaneously across the world. This is a great opportunity, a great chance for free speech, free expression, but it also brings huge risks. A YouTube video called The Innocence of Muslims is posted in Southern California, and within a month, 50 people have died in violent riots in Pakistan and Afghanistan, many of whom had not seen it. Contrarywise, a fatwa is spoken in Tehran or Raqqa, and someone dies in Paris. So the chances are enormous, but so are the risks. The dangers and the question of my work is how do we maximize the chances and minimize the dangers? That's the, that's the job we face. Now, what this connected world, which I call cosmopolis, does is to make in many ways obsolete the classic modern way in which people have thought and written about free speech also in universities, which is in national frameworks, in frameworks of national law, constitutions, and politics. So the old rule of thumb was when in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? When you're in the United States, you have the First Amendment. When you're in England, you have common law. When you're in Germany, German law and constitution and customs. When in China, do as the Chinese and so on. In a world where Rome, because of mass migration, has people from everywhere, and what is said by anyone in Rome can be heard by people anywhere else in the world, that old rule of thumb, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, has broken down. And I argue that our effective freedom of speech is now a product of the interaction of four major forces. The first one is something which we didn't have 100 years ago when this university started, international treaties, organizations, and networks. These now have a significant impact. I was very glad to hear yesterday from a leading Turkish lawyer that judgments of the European Court of Human Rights do actually have an impact on the conduct of the Turkish government. Still, you're part of a framework of the Council of Europe. Those judgments have a major impact on almost every country in Europe except possibly Russia. Uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a legal treaty expression of Article 19 in the UN Declaration, is a significant factor. So, more practically, are the networks of internet governance, which to a large degree determine what you see on your screen and what you don't, right? These are often informal, multi-stakeholder networks, like ICANN, the organization that assigns IP numbers and addresses. So that's the first one. And then there are three others, which I call the big dogs, the big cats, and the mice. The big dogs are the governments. The big cats are Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, what I call the private superpowers. And the mice are you and me. We're the little mice with our mice on the computer. Now, 
rumors of the death of the power of the state over the internet have been much exaggerated. In the cyber utopian optimism of the 1990s, it was almost as if the internet would inevitably set people free. And President Bill Clinton, in the euphoria of cyber utopian optimism, said that for China to try to control the internet would be like nailing jello to the wall. Right? And the Chinese Communist Party turned around and said, Bill, just watch us. And you know what? In the last 15 years, the Chinese Communist Party had made a pretty good stab at nailing jello to the wall, at controlling the liberating potential of the internet. But to do that, it has needed China to build up the largest apparatus of censorship in human history. I think that claim is uncontestable because there's simply so much more speech in all its forms uh, words, images, um, videos, and so on, coming through the internet, that it requires this huge apparatus of censorship to control it. But a really determined, hard authoritarian state can make a pretty good job of nailing jello to the wall. Meanwhile, for many of us, our effective freedom of expression is as much a product of what the big cats do as what, of what the big dogs do. So Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, every day are making editorial decisions about you, what you, you can and cannot see on your computer screen, unbeknown to you, and these decisions are non-transparent, non-accountable, and non-appealable. These are private superpowers. Here is I think are very interesting. That is the map of leading social networks in the world in 2009. And I don't know if you can see, but each different color is a different network. So you can see it was quite a pluralistic world still. Many, many countries had different leading social networks. Fast forward to... Oh, no. Where are we? Oh, there we are. Fast forward to 2014, and the map of the world is painted blue. Everywhere except China, um, Iran, Russia, and a couple of others, it's Facebook. The map of the world used to be painted red, now it's painted blue. And Facebook has 1.9 billion regular monthly users. In other words, if it were a country, it would be the most populous country on Earth. And as I say, it's taking these unaccountable, non-transparent decisions. Quick example, the other day, Facebook's automated algorithm, its software, because most of the decisions are made by algorithm, took down, many of you will know the famous picture of the little Vietnamese girl uh, running down the road naked because her clothes have been burnt off by napalm, screaming in agony, in classic famous news picture. Facebook took it down off the, off the Facebook page of a Norwegian editor. Why? Full frontal nudity, you see. And then they blocked his Facebook page. And it was only when there were major protests, including by the uh, Norwegian government, that it went back up. Now think about it. That decision was reversed because Norway protested. But for that one decision, how many thousand other decisions are there? In effect, sensorial, private sensorial decisions, which have not been reversed because the person was not powerful enough to reverse them. So what about us, the mice? You might think that faced with these international organizations, these big dogs and big cats, we're powerless. Not true. The internet gives us extraordinary new possibilities of networking and networked mice have extraordinary possibilities, not only for communication, but for collective action. And it's very interesting. We, I, I have in the book a lot about Chinese censorship because there are very good studies of it. A Harvard University study looked at some 15 million sensorial decisions on the Chinese internet. And what it found was they actually left up a lot of criticism of officials, particularly local and provincial officials, because they like that. How else are they going to hear where the problems are? except from the secret police. Not 
criticism of the top leaders, of course, and by the way, not criticism of the censors. They took that down straight away. But what they always took down immediately, within 24 hours, was anything which suggested it might be followed by collective action. Even if the collective action was going to be sympathetic to the goals of the Communist Party, that's what they feared, collective action. That is a kind of ironic backhanded tribute to the potential of the internet for, for networked citizens when combined with other forms of activism. Perhaps we can come back to that in the discussion. Now, my next key move is then to say, this being so, given that our effective freedom of expression is a product of the interaction of these four forces, and given that everybody has become neighbors with anyone else, it doesn't get us very far simply to talk in the legal and constitutional terms of one particular tradition, with all the very specific terms of the First Amendment tradition, or European law, or German law, right? Because that, by definition, is going to be a culturally limited debate, and in a sense, a nationally or regionally limited debate. What we have to do is to go back to first principles and to strip the proposition down to the most basic, simplest, normative propositions. What do we really want in terms which are comprehensible and sub possible to debate across all cultures. I was a few weeks ago talking about free speech in India, where, by the way, it's also very much under attack. And at the place where Gandhi was assassinated, in his incredibly simple bedroom, there was on the wall one of his sayings, and it was, simplicity is the essence of universality. Simplicity is the essence of universality. A very simple statement, but I think a very profound one. If we are actually to have the possibility of a transcultural debate, we have to go back to the simplest possible version of what we want to say, so as to be mutually comprehensible. Moreover, another key move in my argument is to say this. The classic question in most of the books, in most of the libraries on free speech, is how free should speech be, right? What should the state allow and what should it ban? I argue there's a second question, which is at least as important, and that is next to how free should speech be, how should free speech be? That is to say, how should we choose to speak, to interact? I argue with what I call robust civility, is a key formula in my book, robust civility, uh, in the large areas which the state should leave us free to speak. And of course, the gamble of democracy, of freedom, is that we replace so far as possible external restraint, ultimately by the threat of force, with self-restraint, with voluntary self-restraint. So those two questions are absolutely crucial. And that too takes you back to the level of norms, to basic principles. So I launched this project about uh, ten years ago, um, we set out, and you can find them here on the website along with a lot of fantastic content. I hope you'll come on the website, freespeechdebate.com. There's far more there than I could ever tell you about today, by the way, in 13 languages. And then we laid out ten very simple principles. And because my degree is in history and not computer science, I can't work out how to get them all on the screen. But they're there on the website anyway, and I, I'll navigate to them. It, um, um, a, a, and what we then did, we laid out some draft principles in a spirit of what I would call normative universalism. And then we put them up there in 13 languages. And then we invited debate from all over the world. And I was here in Turkey five years ago, inviting comment and debate on these draft principles on the subject in India, in China, um, in Egypt, in Germany, in the United States, wherever. And what you see on the site now is a product already of that Habermasian process of interaction of speaking but also of listening, of give and take, of polylogue, as I call it, in the quest for a more universal universalism. Now, what's very interesting about this 
is, of course, that uh, now, of course, let's see if I can find it. No, I can't find it. It's gone. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. No, I'm not connected to the Internet. So I can't show you. You'll just have to believe me. Believe me. The very act of trying to translate these absolutely simple normative principles into 12 other languages itself reveals profound political and cultural uh, fault lines and issues. Quick example, our principle on religion, which is one of the most controversial, as you would imagine, is, as is this work, so actually this website is so brilliantly designed for tablet and smartphone that it's decided this is now a smartphone, but never mind. The principle on religion, as you can see, is we respect the believer, but not necessarily the content of the belief. Now, you can see how demanding that principle is because it distinguishes between the recognition respect of the believer, the individual human being, and appraisal respect of the belief. Now, when you try to translate that into Turkish or Urdu or Arabic, you have the problem, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I gather, that you have to choose between some version of the word mumin, forgive my pronunciation, i.e. the believer in the one true faith of Islam, or a much weaker generic term for the generic believer. And of course, intrinsic in this liberal principle is the notion of the generic believer in any faith or, or belief system. So in the very act of translation, you expose the difficulty. But that's what you have to do in ter if you're looking for a more universal universalism, for what I call a transcultural debate. Um, now, um, if I go back to, if I can, and these are, of course, very simply and boldly stated, just very briefly, the first principle those of you who know Article 19 will recognize that this is a simplified statement of Article 19. We all human beings must be free and able to express ourselves and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas regardless of frontiers. When that was first written, just after the Second World War, the phrase regardless of frontiers was science fiction. What does it mean, regardless of frontiers? It was just an aspiration. Today, in the world of the smartphone, it's a reality. But we've added one crucial word. We must be free and able to express ourselves. An illiterate Indian peasant with no adequate information, education, and no internet access is in no meaningful sense enjoying freedom of expression. So it adds what many of you will know from Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum as the capabilities approach. People have to be able and not just theoretically free. Perhaps... The next most important principle, and for that reason now put at number two, is the principle on violence. And as I traveled around the world, I became convinced that actually if we could get sign in to just these two first principles, we could argue till the cows come home, to our heart's content on all the rest. And it is we neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. And what is novel about this is that it puts not accepting violent intimidation on the same level, on an equal plane, with not inciting to violence, which all liberal jurisdictions uh, forbid, prohibit, or punish. Um, the reason being that, in my view, what I call the assassin's veto, those people who say, if you say or do that, or publish that, you and Charlie Hebdo we will kill you and make that threat credible, are one of the biggest threats to free speech everywhere, including in my own country. Because the result, and you of course know it in this country very well with some famous cases, including that of Frank Dink, the effect of the Charlie Hebdo murders was of course a much wider chilling effect. Self-censorship out of fear. And I can tell you, every publisher, every newspaper editor thinks twice or three times before putting up anything that might go into that territory. Now, what I want to do at this point is, as I mentioned, to bring it closer to Turkey, but in a broader comparative context, 
and to narrow it down to two areas which are of particular importance to an academy of sciences and a university and a democracy. And this is, first of all, now is this going to work? The principle on knowledge, which is, and as you see, they're very, very simply stated, but then we tease them out in the book and on the website, we test them against difficult cases from all over the world, which is what you have to do, what a scientist would do. So the basic principle is we we'll allow no taboos against and seize every chance for the spread of knowledge. Who perhaps at first glance would object to that? Answer, most countries in the world object to that because most countries in the world try to impose some taboos on the spread of knowledge. And one of them will be very familiar to you and it is on the spread of historical knowledge. There are many, many states, including this one, which try to prescribe by law, by criminal law, incidentally, the historical truth. What is or is not true historically, or at least sayable historically. And I believe that all attempts by any state to prescribe or proscribe history uh, are unacceptable on fundamental grounds of academic freedom and freedom of speech. And the reason is this. How does historical knowledge progress? I am myself, by training and profession, a historian. Historical knowledge, unlike some other academic disciplines, proceeds precisely by allowing all theses to be advanced even the most outré and absurd and apparently ridiculous or outrageous, and then allowing them to be openly tested against the available evidence. This is how the thesis of Fritz Fischer, that Germany, Imperial Germany, deliberately planned the First World War, was tested almost to destruction point, tested openly in open argument and scholarly debate against the evidence. This is how A.J.P. Taylor's famous argument that really Europe just stumbled into the Second World War. There was very little intentionality. Hitler wasn't really to blame. It wasn't ideology. Thesis tested to destruction. This is how claims of Holocaust denial, and by this I mean specifically the Nazi Holocaust of the European Jews, were most effectively tested, contested, and discredited. David Irving, well-known British historian and certified Holocaust denier. What happens? He himself goes to court against a historian called Deborah Lipstadt, fine American historian who is documenting that he is a Holocaust denier. He started the court case, not the government, and it went through a famous high court case, and the court found that he was, without doubt, a Holocaust denier. And to anyone with whom he was not discredited anyway, he was marvelously discredited. And then he went to Austria, which has a law criminalizing Holocaust denial, and they locked him up because of something that he'd said in Austria a few years before. What happens? He becomes a martyr for free speech. He was actually invited to speak at the Oxford Union for free speech. And so it has quite the opposite of the intended effect. He was already discredited, but because of the law on Holocaust denial, and this, of course, brings me to the famous issue of whether we should or should not describe what happened to the Armenians in the last years of the Ottoman Empire and the First World War as genocide or not. Now, very briefly to remind you where this history starts, it starts not in this country, it starts in France, where in 1995, Bernard Lewis, a celebrated historian of the Ottoman world, is convicted by a French court for disputing whether what happened to the Armenians was in the strict international legal sense of the term genocide. I, uh, the, you can link, I, we'll link through to the, to the interview on the website and it's very interesting, read it if you have a chance. It's a very thoughtful discussion saying, well, it was a terrible, terrible thing, there's no doubt about that, but did it actually fit the precise legal definition? Then, of course, as you all know, Orhan Pamuk was prosecuted 
for saying the opposite in the Tagesanzeiger, the Tagesanzeiger of Switzerland, that it was a genocide. Then, however, a man called Dorju Perinchek, a name that will be known to some of you, is convicted in Switzerland for saying the opposite, that it wasn't a genocide. So what is state-ordained truth in the Alps is state-ordained falsehood in Anatolia. And you see the absurdity of the attempts to prescribe and proscribe historical truth by law. This story is, of course, carried on with Hassan Jamal publishing recently in Turkey a book called 1915, Armenian Genocide. I'm not making a judgment. I'm not a historian of that period. I'm not making a judgment on the historical facts. I'm making a comment on the validity or value of such laws. Let me add here what seems to me an important distinction. I'm talking now about sanctions imposed by the state. The American political scientist Corey Bretschneider distinguishes between the expressive and the coercive function of the state. My argument is that the state in its coercive function should not attempt to limit in any way the study of history. In its expressive function, the state is, of course, absolutely free and indeed should to mark a Holocaust Day, a Republic Day, in monuments, in museums, and in other forms. This is a freedom that is vital to universities, the freedom to seek the truth about the past. The other one I just want to dwell on for a little because it seems to me particularly relevant here, and again I'm thinking of bringing it back to Turkey, we require uncensored, diverse, trustworthy media so we can make well-informed decisions and participate fully in political life. So the basic idea here is, and I mentioned it before, that for democratic self-government, what you need to do like the citizens of ancient Athens is all together in the public square to hear all the arguments, all the evidence, and then make a decision. And that's how the ancient Athenians decided to fight the invading Persians on sea and not on land, and that's how they came to win the Battle of Salamis, and so deliberative democracy actually saved the world's first democracy. Now, we can't do that in a country the size of Turkey, because it'd be quite difficult to bring all Turks or all Brits together in one place. So we have media. And the question is, do the media perform this basic informing function of allowing us to hear all verses, all voices, all arguments? Diversity. That means that all significant groups in a society are represented in the media, and represented by the media. So if, for example, the Sinti and Roma are simply not present in European media, or if European Muslims are not represented in French or German media, or if Kurds are underrepresented in Turkish media, they are not actually performing that job of uh, representing all communities. Ownership is absolutely crucial here, control by ownership. A.J. Liebling, the great writer on the American press, said famously, Freedom of the press is enjoyed only by those who own one. And we still have the curse of ownership. And what that means in many countries is that the state can actually exert very significant pressure over media, not by direct censorship, but pull through its ways of influencing the business groups that own the media, who have other interests, who can be given contracts by the state, uh, uh, advertising, and again, we actually have on the website a, an article by Professor Kerem Öktem, my former colleague in Oxford, now at Graz University, why Turkey's mainstream media preferred penguins to protest about the reporting of the Gezi Park protests, and he is making precisely the point that there were so many possibilities of influence through ownership. Then, of course, there's violent intimidation, the assassins' v media, but there is also what we have increasingly in other democracies falling subject to populism, which is not so much the censorship, the exclusion of voices, 
but the massive promotion of false messages through echo chambers on social media, Donald Trump uses Twitter, in, and you mentioned it, a post-fact world, a world of fake news, where an emotionally warming narrative, make America great again, trumps, if I can use that verb, trumps all the evidence. And this is what we see in Trump's America, in the Brexit debate, in Narendra Modi's India, in, I think, Turkey increasingly, in Putin's Russia and elsewhere. Then there's the ethos of journalists. I mentioned Hassan Jamal, a great Turkish journalist, in his, um, uh, his last article for Milliet, and that used to be here, I think it's still there, we have it actually in Turkish on the website. This is his last art column for Milliet, the one that was never published because Milliet didn't publish it. He says, in democracies, politicians rule the country and journalists make newspapers. That's how it should be. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson said in 1787, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate for the moment to prefer the latter, newspapers without the government. Now, you may say these are all very fine distinctions you're making, Professor Garton Ash. What has this to do with a country where freedom of speech is under such frontal and brutal and direct attack? Well, I think part of the answer is it really matters to know what you're fighting for, to have a clear sense of how free speech should be in an ideal world. So in describing what is wrong, you're doing that by reference to what is right. Um, so I think the normative uh, process of laying out a framework has an intrinsic value, particularly because of what in, I think, a very powerful German legal concept is called the normative power of the given, the normative Kraft des Faktischen. This is the almost overwhelming tendency to take what you see all around you and to normalize it, to internalize it, so it becomes a norm. And I see this happening with fake news and with the language of populism that things that simply were not acceptable to be said five or ten years ago are now being said and they're becoming normalized, they're becoming normal. And the only way you can fight that normality, that normalization, is by having a very strong, clear idea and sticking to it of how things should be. And sticking to it if need be, like a Václav Havel, even if everybody else around you in your own society is telling to you that you're wrong and crazy. Let me come briefly, because I've gone on quite a long time, let me come briefly now to the part about under attack, and then I can hope it's very open for discussion. I traveled around the world in 2012 talking about this project. Turkey, India, China, Egypt, Russia, Hungary, America, Poland. In every single one of these countries, things in respect of free speech have got very significantly worse in the five years since that set of visits on this. Free speech is under attack everywhere. Turkey has fallen spectacularly in the uh, Freedom House ratings. It's actually had the large, second largest fall in Freedom ratings, second only to the second African, Central African Republic over the last 10 years. In the Press Freedom in Index, it's now uh, 151st out of 180. You all know about these threats much more than I do. What is the broader context? The broader context is I think that we face a wave of nationalist populism which can slide into authoritarianism and at the extreme, as in the Russian case, into fascism. This is a wave not just of illiberalism, it is, I would argue, a wave of anti-liberalism. That is to say, and it's an important distinction, it is a conscious reaction against the prior wave of liberalism and indeed I would say of freedom which had spread very widely. Populism, and you mentioned it, Professor Alpa, has this characteristic, that it speaks in the name of the people. President Erdogan said, we are the people, who are you? That is as classic a populist statement as um, Donald Trump's, I am your voice. Uh, as the, Polish, uh, the Turkish Prime Minister who when 
the EU criticized the suppression of media freedom said, and said a red line had been crossed. I think it was actually Martin Schulz who said a red line had been crossed, uh, replied, the people draw the red lines. And this direct authority that is claimed from the people with a capital P, perhaps better translated as folk, trumps all other sources of authority, independent courts, constitutional courts, sovereign parliaments, civil society, universities, so-called experts, independent media. All of them are trumped. This is the claim of populism by the voice of the people, but the voice of the people, and here it connects back to free speech, is actually not the voice of all the people. It is ventriloquizing like a ventriloquist, the voice of the people, in which it magnifies through the distorted media the voices of some and uh, silences the voices of other. So actually it speaks for the people, but it's only a part of the people. And if you look, for example, to come back to my own country, to the Brexit debate, 52% voted for Brexit, 48% voted against, now everything is done in the name of the people. And the judges who said that the Brexit vote, the vote to trigger Article 50 had to be done through the sovereign parliament were accused by the Daily Mail of being enemies of the people. Yeah, a phrase that has a great heritage from, I think, uh, Robespierre through Lenin and Stalin to Adolf Hitler. So quite a phrase to be using about uh, British judges. That's classic populist rhetoric, some voices magnified, others silenced. And I fear that this is what is happening, what we are witnessing in Turkey today. And if you want a clear statement of that, I would recommend to you the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Professor David Kay's very careful report on his recent trip to Turkey, which spells out very clearly the process through which this is happening. Now, this is a wave that is clearly spreading not just across Turkey, not just across Europe, but across the world. There are such moments in history where we see such waves, and I've experienced one in my lifetime, which is the wave of liberalism and the spread of freedom, and now I fear I'm going to live to experience another. But the possibilities of the connected world, the possibilities of the internet, do give networked mice also possibilities of pushing back, including those possibilities not just of communication and understanding, but of collective action. So there's no cause to give up. The task is quite a difficult one for anyone who self-identifies as a small L liberal, and a small L liberal in the broadest sense, because there are small L liberals of the right and the center as well as the left. Because on the one hand, we have to be self-critical. We have to look at everything we got wrong over the last 30 years, and we got a lot wrong. Because I can tell you, because I've gone and talked to them, those people who were voting for Brexit, or voting for Donald Trump, or voting for Jarosław Kaczynski in Poland, and I'm doubt it, doubtless the same as here, or voting for Modi, had many real grievances to do with the way in which economic and social liberalism, or neoliberalism, if you will, had spread so rapidly to their economic, social disadvantage, and to their cultural discomfort, the sheer speed of change, social liberalization and immigration. These are real concerns which are not to be dismissed just as racism or xenophobia. We have as good liberals to do that self-criticism, but at the same time we have to fight for the values which we believe are not just Western and European, but are universal values. Now, if you're in a fight as a soldier, soldiers aren't usually very self-critical, I'd have to tell you, at least the soldiers I know, but that's what liberal soldiers have to do. They have to fight, but be self-critical at the same time. But even if that's not how you understand your task, even if as academics, students, journalists, intellectuals, you simply see your task as seeking the truth, which is our central task, 
and then telling it as clearly, vividly, interestingly, and analytically as we can. Even then, freedom of speech is essential to that basic task of academics and of journalists, to seek the truth. Um, the, um, in, in Prague in 1989, in the Velvet Revolution, um, which broke down a semantic monopoly of the state over the public sphere, Václav Havel spoke from the balcony of a newspaper which is called Svobodny Slovo, the free world, and the slogan of his Czech Republic was Pravda Vitenzi, truth will, truth will prevail. The motto of my city, not that that's my university, but the city is Fortis est veritas et praiva levit, truth is great and will prevail. Now, in this country and in this university, we now have, I think, a rather fine new version, truth cannot be expelled. Well, what we have to be realistic here, we have to be realistic idealists. Truth can be suppressed, can be suppressed for quite a long time. It can be oppressed. It can be hidden. But ultimately, it will prevail. And the crucial point is that both to seek the truth and to speak the truth, freedom of speech is essential. Without freedom of speech, we cannot seek or speak the truth. And without finding the truth, there is nothing worth speaking freely about. <laughs>